Okay, morning. I'm Darren, um, one of the down accredited registrars. Um, this morning I'll be talking on sliding hip screws compared to intramedullary nails for fair drop and carry compression hip uh, Just as an introduction, very, very common uh, flexion of femurs. There's about 250,000 a year in the US, uh, about 100,000 a year here in Australia. Um, it's predicted to double within the next 25 years. Half of these uh, are pertrochanteric or endotrochanteric fractures. They cost about $10 billion a year. Um, approximately 9 out of 10 occur in uh, elderly patients, greater than 65, uh, especially osteoporotic patients, and three quarters of them are female. Uh, so there's an annual rate of 63 of 100,000 in the elderly women and 30, about half of that in men. Majority from simple falls and there's an 11 fold increase in hospitalised patients. So uh, the patients in the ward are at higher risk of falling and fracturing the hip. Um, as I was saying before, osteoporosis is a uh, very uh, high uh, predictive uh, uh, thing of uh, intratrochanteric fractures. We're at 16.6 uh, fractures per 100 people with the bone density less than 0.6. Uh, younger patients are usually associated with high energy traumas, and as you know, these are extra capsular fractures. Uh, so the vascularity to the uh, femoral head is uh, is uh, rarely compromised. Um, traditionally, the management of uh, all uh, intertrochanteric um, and per fractures was via a sliding hip screw. Um, but uh, over the last probably 10 to 15 years, uh, the interim valerie nail has come more into vogue. And I'll go into reasons why. Um, just what happens to these patients um, after the operation. So, uh, for them to get home, um, usually they're less than 85, uh, they have less comorbidities. Uh, they're pre fracture independence. Um, if they were independent, then they're more likely to get back home. And uh, the way they walk after the operation, uh, they're all positive predictors of getting back home. Um, and fracture type is not a predictor of mortality. So, just going into, there's multiple classifications for pertrochanteric or intertrochanteric fractures. Um, just in the, within the research, they tend to look at two major classification sy sy systems. There's the Evans system, which was modified by Jensen and Michelson. And this is a fairly simple uh, classification system, which breaks up the fractures into stable or unstable fractures. And uh, I think it's quite a good classification system because it can help guide your management uh, when you look at the x-rays. So uh, they break it up into stable, as I said, which is generally two-part fractures. Um, they may be displaced or undisplaced. And then they break it up into unstable fractures. So unstable fractures make up about 5 to 10 percent of all intertrochanteric fractures. Okay, and in their classification, unstable fracture is three or more parts. It's a reverse oblique or a transverse fracture. Um, so this is a reverse uh, oblique type picture here um, and a transverse type uh, fracture and with a subtrop or a subtrochanteric extension. So they classify those as all being unstable fractures. Uh, unfortunately, the AO classification is also very common in, uh, in the literature. Uh, so I thought I'd quickly go over that. Um, the classification does have one benefit is that in that um, the it does look at the lateral cortex um, of the uh, femur which uh, is important when looking at management. So 31A is uh, basically uh, the trochanteric region of the femur and then it's broken up into divided into 1, 2 and 3 and each of those is subclassed into 1, 2 and 3. Uh, so class 1 is uh, uh, simple two-part fractures, which are, uh, correlate to the Evans um, uh, stable fractures. Class 2 is multifragmented uh, uh, with medial cortex and lesser trochanter broken, but the lateral cortex remains intact, and uh, class 3, the lateral cortex is broken. So this is just quickly uh, uh, diagrammatic. So class one, you can see uh, all the stable type fractures. Class two, basically two one and two two are fairly stable. Two three is starting to become unstable with uh, uh, lots of uh, fragments. And then you're looking down here at the uh, reverse oblique, the um, 
basically the transverse fracture with loss of the lateral wall and the transverse fracture here. So these are all unstable fractures. Just a quick for the more for the residents uh, review over just the sliding hitch screws. So there's multiple variety of hitch screws. Um, obviously the plate attaches to the shaft and the sliding screw uh, inserted in the femoral head. Um, the screw helps maintain the valve's various angle. Um, it also allows the uh, fracture to uh, reduce and compress on weight bearing. Um, here at Western Health last year, from my understanding, so the Omega is the most commonly used um, sliding hip screw. They did about 200, just over 200 cases here last year. And each case costs about $500 for the, uh, that's just for the, um, the hip screw and the screws. Okay, not, not including theatre time, things like that. So just in the metal wear, there's over $100,000 spent here last year. Um, this is just diagrammatic. Uh, that's what the Omega looks like. And uh, that's the radiographs just showing how it compresses. Intramedullary nails, so there are multiple varieties here, the short and long nails. Um, they also have a sliding screw. The advantage of intramedullary nails, which we'll go into uh, in more detail, is that it gives a lateral buttress. So for the intertrochanteric fractures, which have lost the lateral wall, um, the intramedullary nail gives a lateral buttress for support. Um, so it also has a mechanical advantage over the sliding hip screw. So it's located closer to the center of rotation. So, um, and so uh, it has a, uh, a smaller lever arm, so there's less force going through it, and it's a stronger construct and can also withstand higher forces, so uh, it's less likely to fail. In Western Health last year, they used a gamma nail mainly, they did about 50 cases, about one a week, gamma nails. So you can see the gamma nails are more than four times the price of the, of the um, long gamma, so I don't think they used any short gammas here last year. So. That's the long gamma. Um, so for a quarter of the amount of cases, the cost was fairly similar. And this is the uh, gamma nail here. Uh, like okay, so now we come to the question of what should we use and when, when to use it. So there are multiple, multiple studies, hundreds of studies on, uh, on this, and uh, there are multiple systematic reviews and meta-analysis of just uh, I'm just going to describe about the last three or four meta-analysis, just quickly go through their results and then the problems with those and then talk in a little bit more detail about um, uh, the fracture type. So uh, Parker uh, in 2008 uh, did a meta-analysis in the Cochrane Review and uh, they had 3,500 patients who did this meta-analysis and they found that between the sliding hip screw and the intramedullary now that there was no differences in mortality, non-union rate, cutout rate, blood loss, operative time and radiation time. However, they did find significantly a significant increase in intraoperative and postoperative secondary distal femur fractures and reoperation rate. And so that was within the intramedullary now group. They found that there was a significant increase in post in postoperative and intraoperative femur fractures and reoperation rate. Oh, actually, it's, it's both, but mainly long now. Yeah. Okay, it's both, but mainly long now. Um, they <coughs> stated that the sliding hip screw is a better fixation device for intertrochanteric fractures compared with the nail. Okay. However, they did not separate their fractures into unstable and stable fractures. And so the issue there is that I think these are two completely different types of fractures which require different types of fixation and uh, unfortunately they did not do it. Despite having 3,500 patients they, didn't, they were unable to do the research due to the papers they were using to split it into unstable and stable fractures. Um, Bandari and his group in um, Canada in 2009 looked at 25 prospective randomised uh, controlled trials. They had about, uh, about 1,100 people in this. So they tried to break it up into unstable and stable fractures and also they looked at time course and basically said prior to 97, 1997 and after 1997 they looked at the papers and the um, fixation in those time periods and the reason they did that was um, they found that 16 percent, uh, there's a 16 percent rate of distal femur fractures when using 
the uh, instrument double nail. But when looking back, they found that the majority of those occurred prior to 1997, and that was about the time when the gamma nail or and the instrument double nail said it had uh, changed from a basically phase one model to a phase two and phase three model. And so they found that uh, it was more the anatomical structure of the, um, the nail itself that had uh, too much valgus within the, uh, the nail and so that they were abutting the lateral wall and causing fractures in the lateral, lateral wall. Um, they also found that uh, uh, with experience, and they went through and looked at that, um, that with the experienced users that they were able to ream better, have a um, better nail selection um, and that reduced the, the uh, fracture rate. Uh, so as I said, prior to 97, there was four and a half times higher risk of fracturing the nail. After 97, with the new versions of the nail, the, the risk had decreased. So it wasn't actually completely eliminated, but it had been decreased. They also tried to look at um, stable and unstable fractures, but as I was saying before, about 5 to 10 percent of all intracognitary fractures are unstable, so 95 percent are stable. When they, they only had just over 1,000 patients in their group, unfortunately, um, when you're looking at 5% of 1,000, it's only 50 or 60 patients. Um, so the power of these studies looks be quite low. So, but they, from that, they did say that they found that sliding hip screws, when used in unstable intracognitary fractures, had a failure rate of about 15%. They thought possibly some of it's due to operative technique, which I'll talk about in a minute, but um, they also felt that in the intracognitary nail would be the uh, treatment of choice. And then Liu in 2010, uh, another meta-analysis, had over 1,200 patients. Um, he didn't break up the uh, prior to 97, after 97, and so he found that there was an increase, a fairly large increase in femoral shaft fractures, but also found there's no de de difference in mortality, infection, reoperation, and uh, walking independently. Uh, they also did not separate to unstable and stable fracture patterns. So, from, from this uh, data, it looks like the treatment of choice for uh, a sliding hip screw in stable, so it's a stable intracognitary fractures. There's less risk of femoral shaft fracture, it's cheaper, shorter operative time, and there's no difference in mortality, non union, cutout rate, blood loss, um, or any of the other things. So, in stable fractures, the sliding hip screw is the treatment of choice. So what I then did is I went and had a look at articles which tried to break up the so randomised controlled trials that tried to break up the um, stable and unstable fractures and looked mainly at unstable fractures and the use of dynamic hip screws or um, sliding hip screws with the intramedullary uh, nails. So I think there's no argument that um, the sliding hip screws are the treatment of choice in uh, stable fractures. But in unstable fractures, we'll see that. Um, so these are some of the articles that I've um, looked at. So sliding hip screws in unstable fractures. Um, these articles show that there's up to a 40% failure rate uh, if they if a sliding hip screw is used in an unstable fracture. And the commonest mode of failure is um, a progressive varus deformity, and with the proximal migration, and eventually cut out of the um, screw head. Um, they found that th there's increased difficulty with positioning of the, uh, the screw within the head when it's a, uh, an unstable fracture. Um, but they did find that if the uh, screw was placed in a good position, that it did uh, greatly reduce the risk of um, cutout. Just in regards to screw position, mainly for some of the residents here, um, Baumgartner in 95 talked about the tip apex distance, and that's basically the sum of the distance from the tip of the screw um, to the uh, apex of the femoral head on both the AP and lateral views. And this is the strongest indicator of uh, cutout. And um, they found that if, if you're more than 25 millimetres away, the, you greatly increase the, uh, the risk of cutout. And uh, this is just a diagram showing the, uh, uh, the measurements, how it's done. And in his study, he found that <coughs> less than 25 millimetres, there was no cutout at all. But as you got above 25 millimetres, uh, in the tip apex distance, the cutout rate increased proportionally um, until greater than 45 millimetres, where there was a very high rate of cutout. Yeah, so what they did here, this is the tip apex distance, and to 
uh, rule that magnification. What they did was you measure the width of the screw, uh, and so you know the screw width uh, from uh, what the anatomical width of the screw is, and then you measure the distance on the X-ray, and you divide the true width by the apparent width width on the X-ray, and that gives you a magnification, and then you multiply that by the distance, and so that gives you the true uh, AP distance and the true lateral distance, and so that then you get your um, tip apex distance. Um, and so these, uh, the literature also shows that um, the sliding hip screw, but in this case they look at DHSs, um, that uncontrolled medialization of the, the distal fracture relative to the proximal one is a, a large cause of failure and cutout. And so what helps stop medialization is having a lateral wall on the, the distal uh, uh, part of the bone. So um, as I was saying earlier on, if the lateral wall is missing, then it's classified as a uh, unstable fracture. Um, and so, uh, with the lateral wall missing, that then means that you get increased medialization and failure. So, um, the screw will compress fully and then it'll begin to cut out. And uh, failure is proportional to the degree of medialization. And Parker did a, a uh, study in '96 where he looked at the degree of medialization um, and the percentage failure. So. If the distal fragment was 50% of the proximal fragment, then it's about a 50% failure rate. Um, and it just increased proportionally uh, until if it was almost off-ended, obviously the failure rate was 100%. Um, studies also saw that about 20% of the dialing nails versus 35% had a failure rate uh, in revision of reverse oblique uh, fractures. But a sliding hip screw is almost has om almost an equivocal failure rate as the intramedullary nail if a trachinteric sliding plate is used with the um, with the sliding hip screw. There are some issues with this though. The slide, the, it's a more difficult operation to put the uh, stabilising plate on. It's a larger incision, uh, takes more time, so um, it obviously increases um, the, the difficulty. So. Um, the sliding hip screw can be almost equivocal in um, uh, unstable fractures, but then, as I said, the increased size of wound, increased uh, uh, operation time, increased difficulty of operation. Um, the other thing that these articles showed was that not, not only is it important that you have a lateral wall, but it's important that the lateral wall is thick enough to withstand reaming with the screw. So if it is too thin and uh, breaks when, when reaming, um, the non-union rate goes from 3% to 30% uh, and uh, with an eight-fold risk of revision. So what I mean by lateral wall, as you can see here, this segment of bone here, the lateral wall is gone, it's fractured off. So the proximal uh, mm -hmm. part of the fracture will reduce down and what will happen then is you get medialization of this distal part of bone. So you can see the medial cortex here is no longer in the alignment of the medial cortex here. And so then uh, the screw basically backs down or compresses down as far as possible and then starts to cut out. Okay. Um, Intrapedalary nails, the, it's, uh, as I said, they're increasing use. Uh, it's, it's doubled uh, recently. Uh, some of the advantages are minimally invasive, decreased infection rate um, in unstable fractures, increased stability and greater rigidity. Uh, the uh, the central medullary position also helps uh, buttress the um, the proximal fragment, uh, and uh, uh, also um, uh, so it helps in uh, maintaining the position. So as you can see here, this is a unstable fracture, and uh, the the nail itself helps helps. Uh, buttress the uh, proximal part of the fracture. Um, it also helps reduce the risk of shortening and valgus deformity we just talking about, um, although there is still a the, the risk of, uh, of femoral shaft fractures. Um, some research also found that it's more difficult to place the, uh, the screw within the centre of the head um, just because that relies on the position of the uh, nail itself. 
Um, just just with um, the uh, position of the, the nail to avoid the valve's position, there's been some papers done by Hack who um, said that uh, with the positioning of the the nail when reaming and uh, putting down the guide wire that um, it's uh, some people put it through the fracture, and so that then causes valgus deformity, uh, which obviously increases the amount of force going through the um, fracture. So they'd uh, suggested uh, putting further traction on and then trying to put the guide wire and the screw and um, reaming through the, the, uh, the lateral part of the uh, proximal. I think they're, they're, try they're trying to say that um, you to go slightly medial of the tip yeah. of the trochanter. Yeah. That's, Rather than going too lateral, um, otherwise you can get further valgus deformity, uh, a various deformity. Sorry. So, just in uh, uh, summary, the uh, sliding hip screw is the treatment of choice mm -hmm. in stable intratrochanteric fractures, and I think there's little doubt of that. Uh, the intramedullary nail or the sliding hip screw with a trochanteric stabilisation plate seems to be uh, the treatment of choice uh, in unstable fractures. But we all always need to consider the, a few facts. Firstly, the surgeon, do they have experience with the, uh, the, the nail or not? Uh, if not, um, then they may prefer to use the screw. Um, we need to look at the, the, the patient. So is the patient well enough to have the femur reamed? Do they have uh, high right heart pressures? Are they increased risk of having um, uh, pulmonary hypertension? Are they well enough for the longer operation? Um, do they have, uh, are they going to be walking, what's their pre-morbid status like? Do they walk around like, if they don't walk around, they may not need the nail, it's more expensive, it's a harder operation, it's a longer operation. And then obviously we look at the fracture type. I think if, if with all things equal, if the, uh, if the patient is well enough that an intramedullary nail uh, is, is a, a better management uh, for an unstable fracture than the, the sliding hip screw. Just quickly for, more so for the, the residents, um, there was a paper by, uh, in, in the JBJS in 2009, and it looked at 10 tips for intertrochanteric fractures, and this is, um, when you'll be doing a, a nail, it's just a, a good um, guide of, um, of what to do. So, as I spoke about before, tip apex distance is very important. Um, uh, no lateral wall, you shouldn't use a screw, as we spoke about before. Um, you should nail the inter, uh, unstable introchanteric fractures, as we spoke, and they are the reverse oblique fractures. Anything that's a large posterior wall, fra wall fragment missing, that's just because the calca is uh, generally affected. Um, if there's a trans or a, a, a horizontal fracture, and uh, if the fracture extends into the uh, subtrochanteric region. Um, be careful with the bow in the femur, so if you can't get the nail down with pushing it down, don't start smashing it with a, a uh, mallet because you'll end up going up the lateral wall. Um, here's so start medially, as we spoke about before, to avoid the various deformity. Um, so don't ream an unreduced fracture because all you end up doing is reaming the fracture, it stays in the unreduced pos position, and you end up nailing it in the unreduced position. Uh, don't hammer the nail. Um, Avoid various angulation, um, and so you have to avoid that obviously with the traction and a more medial placement of your um, the guide wire. Uh, lock that. So they say lock distantly because it avoids rotary instability, um, and avoid distraction when um, now. So make sure you reduce the fracture. Um, so he's which uh, is a cut out with a uh, reverse oblique. Um, also. Um, once again, the reverse oblique, um, and this is nailing. Review, uh, so you need to reduce the fracture because even the nail will fail if the 